Well, hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. I'm excited to have my friend Drew Gurian uh, sitting next to me today. How are you doing, Drew? Excellent. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you again. You were just on a uh, panel recently that we hosted. I here. was, yeah, just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I had a great time and very happy to be back here with you. Yeah. Everybody can go to um, photobrigade.com slash live if they want to see our live events. If you want to see the, the panel in question, go there. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you'd go ahead and click the subscribe button on YouTube. Uh, that way you can uh, be updated whenever we get our uh, new podcast and new content out there. Um, thank you to Adorama, their event space, for letting us host these events here uh, on such a regular basis. Thanks to Chewy uh, for, for switching and doing all the camera work. Um, and uh, thank you to Canon Professional Services for all your support and, of course, Temba Bags. So with that out of the way, on to Drew. <laughs> Drew, I'm not sure when we met. Do you recall when we met? Oh, man. I, I. It's like, you know, it's one of these weird situations because it's like the Internet makes everybody, you know, we've been on Facebook, sure. friends for quite some time. It was, it was probably uh, back when I used to work for a, a certain photographer who I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. But probably we've known each other for quite a while now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Drew is a professional. Um, he, he's a music and portrait photographer here in Manhattan. Um, you've, uh, you know, your, your background, uh, we'll, we'll dive into your background, but, but right now I've, I've just been noticing how much amazing work you've been producing. What, tell me a little bit about the clients. So we'll, we'll go through some of your photos. Give me a little background about the work that you do and, and, uh, sure. So yeah, as you said, most of my work is in the music and entertainment realm. Um, specifically, uh, the majority of what I do is portrait work, uh, portraits and a lot of behind the scenes work as well. Um, a lot of celebrity work lately. A lot of celebrity. Is this yep. lately that you've been doing the celebrity work or I'd say the last uh year and a half or so but in particular probably the last yeah yeah the last year or so i've been doing a lot more of it um on a much more regular basis right so yeah sort of a, a mix of uh commercial editorial and a bit of ad work here and there so right uh, yeah kind of a, a varied group of clients but uh really fortunate to uh to have made the strides that i've made so far and uh Right. Yeah. So now another thing is, is, is when you started your professional career here in New York, mm -hmm. you moved into a big, uh, like a studio space, right? Is, isn't that like you have a studio where you live? I do. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a big loft space in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Um, I currently, I'm, I'm moving at the end of, uh, oh, okay. end of this month, actually. It's all, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, I do have a space with actually, uh, two other photographers and a photo editor. Oh, cool. Wow. So we're, we're basically a small agency, uh, oh, but we yeah. do you have uh yeah it's a big old uh, industrial loft space so we do have shooting space as well if i'm doing a small more or less personal shoot um yeah. i'm happy to to shoot there uh we have 13 or 14 foot ceilings we have a great rooftop and all of that so was that on the rooftop uh, no morning? that was actually no. at dune studios oh, okay but uh and that that is not my terrace unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we do have a shooting space for sure very cool um so you know, let's let's talk a little bit about your background. Like, sure. how did you get into the world of photography, um, and and what led you to become a professional? Sure. So, if we start, uh, I guess way back, sort of. Um, I'm family friends with a band called uh, Guster, who was sort of an acoustic rock uh, band. When I was, uh, you know, probably 14 or 15 years old, they were still sort of very much in the up and coming phase. And as a family friend of mine, they sort of. Uh, gave me photo access whenever I wanted to shoot them. And literally at the time, I just thought that it was a cool thing to take photos of a band that I enjoyed. Sure, Just yeah. being a fan. I was, the, I was the same way. Sure, yeah. with Bieber, right? <laughs> Not with Bieber. He was 15 at the t <laughs> when I photographed him, but I was when I was 15, it was like Dave Matthews' band sure, that I was sure. trying to get access to. So, and it, you know, when you're, when you're starting out doing something like that, you really, you can't have any foresight as to, oh, I'm gonna be a professional photographer one day. You really have no idea. But, um, and at the time I was simply shooting live photos of a band. I didn't think that there was anything more to it. I didn't even have an idea of shooting a, a band backstage or anything like that. It was simply capturing a live performance uh, mm -hmm. because that's what I had access to do. And I didn't even think to ask for more access at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a good thing that I didn't because I really had no idea what I was doing. And, uh, you know, so photographing them, uh, Nothing on my website will ever be seen of, of those days. Right, of course, um, yeah. <laughs> however, what 
that did was allowed me to learn the basics of exposure and composition and timing, learning how to capture a band when they're at the peak of action uh -huh. in a song, in a chorus, in a solo, something like that. So um, it enabled me to get down my technical chops and kind of learn a rhythm to photography and to work really fast and to get good with my settings because as you know shooting bands in a live situation oh sure you know, everything is changing the uh, lights changing all the time of course yeah. people are running around the stage so there's there's a lot to be learned in those types of scenarios and uh so that that early period let me do that i photographed them and a bunch of bands that they were playing with for a couple of years and uh just the the, the hobby really turned into a passion um, ended up going to school for photo and graphic design, and uh, while I was in college, uh, I seeked out two internships uh, during, I think, my sophomore and junior years. Uh, I was fortunate to grow up around the New York City area, right outside the city in New Jersey. Okay. And, uh, you know, so... What were your internships? Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll get to that in just oh, one okay. second. Sorry. So mm -hmm. I, I started with one of my teachers... Uh, one of my advertising design teachers recommended that I get a subscription to Communication Arts Magazine, uh -huh. a really good magazine, and uh, they have a photo annual every year, uh -huh. which is some of the best of the best work out there. And each year, what I would do when I was looking for an internship was look through CA, and this is before, you know, this is, you know, 2002, 2003, before it was as easy to find contact info online as it is now. So basically just went through and put sticky notes on pages of photographers that I liked. Uh -huh. And uh, the first, uh, which was uh, Joe McNally, uh, right. who a lot of you may be familiar with, a National yep. Geographic photographer for 25 plus years. Uh, so I, I simply, you know, put in a call to his studio and uh, asked if they needed an intern. And uh, Joe actually was in the city like a week later or something, and I met him at like an Aubon Pond on like West Broadway. <laughs> nice. And I bought a portfolio with me. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah, sure. You know, you, you, it's important that your intern is a great photographer. So you, <laughs> you, you, you knew, I mean, when you looked at, like, for instance, Joe, was it... Was it his uh, National Geographic work? Was it his lighting work? Was it, what was it about you that drew you to that sort of internship? I just, there, there was a cool factor for me. I, I had actually seen him uh, speak at main media workshops the year before I was there taking a workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name sort of rang a bell when I then saw his name in the CA photo annual. So for me, just sort of seeing someone doing this really crazy production work beautifully lit. Um, it was just really cool for me. And I knew nothing about that at the time. Right. Absolutely nothing. Um, but I remembered his name from seeing him speak. I remembered really enjoying his talk. Yeah. And uh, just figured I'd give him a call. So it, I interviewed with a couple of people each summer yeah. uh, to intern for. And they all, generally speaking, offer you positions. Uh -huh. And I kind of just picked the one that I thought would give me the most hands-on experience. And uh, it sure did. It did. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, that's a, a lot of, uh, you know, what I see from you or had seen from you on Facebook is traveling all around the world, sure. you know, having all of these opportunities and also, I mean, sort of learning from one of the masters of light, I'd say. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, so the the internship initially, that was in, I believe, 2003 for Joe. Mm -hmm. um, then what happened was the next summer I interned for a very, very well-known music photographer by the name of Danny Clinch. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I finished school. I was freelance for a couple of years. I'd stayed in touch with Joe's studio this whole time uh, with Lindo Master, his amazing studio manager and producer. And then I was applying to grad schools in 2008. Uh huh. And uh, Joe offered me a job as his first assistant. Hence the world travels and all of that. Hence the world travels yep. and everything. So yeah, I worked for him for four and a half years as his first assistant, and I traveled probably seventy five percent of the year, uh, literally all over the world. It's incredible. Uh, I remember in twenty twelve, I think I flew like one hundred and seventy thousand miles on Delta, and pl <laughs> plus some other airline travel. Wow. So it was it was. So you're like a diamond elite status, or at I least was. You were. I had all the lounge <laughs> access, got a lot of upgrades. Well, once you stop, it goes all away, right? It does. It does. <laughs> now, what a shame. now I'm back to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, what what working for him for so long enabled me to do, and I I had no, um, I couldn't have anticipated working for him for as long as I did. My initial goal I think was like two years. Yeah, and uh, I was sort of looking at it as grad school. Yeah, and I was actually applying to grad schools for photojournalism when he offered me the job. Right. So to me, it ended up making a lot more sense to take that. Uh, a because I didn't have to necessarily go into debt. I could actually make. A living yeah uh, I could work for one of the best people out there yeah and get paid to travel all over the world so it was obviously intense but but it was and make incredible connections 
Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It just just the nature of going to all of these, you know, conventions and workshops and seeing these different people. Sure. I mean, you know. I could not have been more well prepared than I was by the time I left working for him. Um, just by the fact that I worked for him for so long and I did meet a lot of people and I learned a hell of a lot technically. Um, you know, I owned a softbox before working for him. And it's not that this it is... Was it wasn't a Joe McNally softbox? It was not. <laughs> but but it, it's not that this is a gear-centric talk, but, yeah. you know, I owned a softbox and I knew relatively well how to use a softbox to produce a soft light. But, like, that was yeah. the extent of my sure. lighting knowledge. Sure. That and, and an on-camera flash. Yeah. So, I mean, I was around some pretty crazy productions uh, during my time working with him. I mean lighting the world's largest land-based telescope, which was a 20-story building, things like that, doing Incredible. a lot of aerial work from helicopters, doing, I mean, all sorts of stuff all over the place, um, some of which was for National Geographic and lots of other publications and commercial yeah. clients and all that. So just a lot of uh, technical experiences, life experiences, worldly experiences, just just things that have really, in, uh, you know, inspired me to this day and yeah. really sort of have dictated how I sort of live my life and, and run my career and all yeah, of those things. Absolutely. Let's jump into uh, more now what you're doing these days. You're 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 billing yourself more as a music photographer sure. and a, a portrait photographer. We've already gone through a lot of your portraits. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we should mention this is a, a new website that's gonna be being launched soon. <laughs> this, this is, is a new not website. Quite, not quite out there yet. But it's not. So if you go to my website right now, uh, you will not see this version of it online. It but depends when we end up publishing this true, and if you're watching this true. live or not. So, yes, but, but this soon is, this will be uh, Drew, DrewGurian.com. Uh, correct. And it's not yet. So, but, but by the way, if anyone's curious, this is uh -huh. not a normal slideshow that we typically do, but this is a photo shelter um, website. This is the full screen option. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the theme that I'm using, but I uh, really kind of fell in love with it. Photo and, shelter has uh, a beam. Uh, platform yep. or whatever and uh, so anyways photoshelter.com they're amazing people and this is the full screen sort this of option screen, yeah. for that website so yep so let's let's talk about uh, getting into the the music world sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> boom well where do we start um yeah so a as you did say a lot of my work is portrait based um but a lot of what i do is also behind the scenes work uh this is sort of in there i'm still figuring out the placement for this not music but not yeah. music uh all access though i did spend uh, a day in the white house this past year which well was, let's talk about that since we got cool. it up that i remember seeing you on facebook all suited up and everything what, oh, yeah. what, were, what was tell me about this shoot with president There's obama a news website by the name of mike.com they sort of build themselves as kind of the the times of the millennial generation uh -huh. Or, or so they're trying to be, and they're doing a great job so far. They have a huge following, and uh, they did a sit-down interview with uh, President Obama in the library of the White House mm -hmm. uh, last, I want to say, August, mm -hmm. uh, about the Iran nuclear deal. Oh, yeah. So they, I got the craziest email, you know, one of those like, you know, I'm so-and-so, an editor with Mike.com, curious if you're interested in this shoot. Um, oh, yeah. It's like, what, President Barack Obama, where, the White House, and you're just like... <laughs> Your face is melting and you're you're going absolutely crazy and you respond as quickly as you can. Yes, I'm absolutely interested. Let's yes. like talk Please right now. Please don't give this away. Yeah. Yeah. So so I was uh, shooting stills during the video interview uh, for the first couple of days when I was assigned the job. Uh, there was talks from the White House that I would uh, get two minutes to do a quick portrait with the president as well. Um, so for those couple of days when I thought that that was happening, I was obviously kind of losing my mind and calling everybody I knew who has photographed the president or past presidents and trying to get some really amazing insight that you could only get from those types of people. Right. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Peter Yang, uh, who's become a friend of mine, who shot the cover photo of Barack Obama for Rolling Stone magazine early in his presidency or when he was still running, um, you know, he told me that uh, the president only likes to be lit from camera left. Is that so? Yeah. So, so things like that. He does like have that. a preference. That's that's something. He does, and and these these figures are are photographed so much that yeah, they know how they look good, oh, and yeah. and having the insight uh, like that, that you you would only get from somebody like that who's been in that mm -hmm. particular situation is absolutely priceless because your time is so limited with yeah. these people. So uh, unfortunately, the the portrait shoot did not happen yeah um about two days before they, they big surprise right <laughs> right so i did not get to do that but i uh, did get to spend 20 minutes with them in the library of the executive residence of the white house which was an incredible experience yeah and got to uh get a selfie with Bo, the first dog and, uh, I saw that, and a yeah. picture with the president which was great that's so, cool yeah. yeah absolutely um did you get to, to meet pete souza was he around pete was not around oh bummer yeah unfortunately 
Yeah, but. he was. A, we we went to the White House and did a, a broadcast with Pete. It was cool. really cool. Of course. And of course, I didn't get to meet the president. Unfortunately, he didn't. He did. I, I was hoping that the president would like crash the the podcast, but <laughs> didn't happen either. So oh, well. anyway, back to back to your music photography. That was a really cool story. Sure. And, um, so so yeah, let's let's get into um, how and why you got into music photography. I mean, you already talked about the. Um, you know. Yeah, Guster and all that, but um, I, I've always been interested in music. I've been a huge music fan, going to shows, and I, uh, I played drums for a long time. I was in a band in Pennsylvania uh, in college and then after college. So to me, it's been a really great way to sort of stay involved in the music industry. I've always been fascinated with it. Um, and more than that, um, what you're showing right now, for instance, is lots of bands offstage, whether it's backstage or, or away from... Uh, a venue completely. This I. is your all, all access, right? Correct. Yeah. And to me, these types of photos are as important or more important to me, along with portraits, than than a lot of the the live work that I've shot over the years. So much more fun to document real life than it just what's really staged is. in front of you. I love the live concert aspect of it. I mean, capturing raw energy like that. There's there's really nothing like it. But obviously, my preference, and I think most photographers' preferences, would be to have a hundred percent access uh something like this even which is a live photo that's mm -hmm. kendrick lamar at summer jam which is at uh, metlife stadium i.e giant stadium uh -huh. last summer you know having all access for an event like that and being able to get a perspective like this that really is what, a lot more storytelling what gets you that sort of access uh this was through the production company okay so, uh, so your, your client was their production company correct okay yep. so that's a difference uh you know normally not normally, but a lot of people shoot as press, and they usually just get the first three songs in the pit. Of course. Or of course. depending the band, it could be halfway across the venue. Of course. And and with that said, yeah, uh, a lot of what I really try to do to um, put myself in a unique perspective is to really use access to my advantage. Oh, yeah. Um, because it does it does set you apart from, say, another music photographer who only has that access uh -huh. so you know i spent a couple minutes with wayne coin of the flaming lips right before they went on stage a year or two ago and he's quite <laughs> an interesting character yeah. <laughs> uh wearing a, a muscular skeleton suit of some sort before with he went some, on stage with some tassels, tassels on his <laughs> crotch very nice <laughs> um yeah but i've really tried to use access to my advantage um whether that be portraits or more behind the scenes and of course music uh, as we you know, as you've shown, has also sort of spread into a lot more celebrity work as well, which are I think is a natural progression for me. Are you a big music lover? Like, I mean, do you particularly like love music? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, genres all over the board, but but yeah, I'm kind of constantly listening to music, and yeah, for sure. Cool. Cool. Um, how how building the portfolios like these? I mean. I'm not looking at your current website, obviously, and sure. I haven't seen the difference side by side. But um, do you have you found that, like you said, having all these music uh, acts in your portfolio, celebrities, it leads to more. The more the more that you put up, the more you get of that kind of work. Do you? Sure, I think that's um, a very good point. In that um, you you show the work that you want to get. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of the work that I have done, I'd say probably. 80% of the work that I've ever shot has been music related and probably the other 15% is celebrity. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing a lot more of that. And then an even smaller percentage is more like personal, whether it's travel work or what have you. Um, so yeah, I've been showing that type of work and that's primarily what I've been getting hired to do. Um, as I shoot more celebrity work, I think I, I've been getting more of that as well yeah. on a more consistent basis. So I think that that's, that's naturally that what you show is, is kind of what you get. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk a little bit on the business side uh, sure. of things because one of the things that I mentioned before is that uh, a lot of photographers that might have had experience shooting concerts are doing it from a not all access sort of situation, which seems you have a lot of, um, and that has to do with the fact that you're shooting a lot more commercial work mm -hmm. rather than journalistic work. What sort of percentage of your business would you say is commercial versus editorial? Um, you know, just generally. I would say my work is probably probably 65-75% commercial, mm -hmm. um, probably another 
twenty percent editorial and another ten percent if that adds up to a hundred of, <laughs> of some advertising work. You're a photographer, not a mathematician. <laughs> <Exactly>. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, shooting commercial work is what really does uh, enable me to make a living in the music and entertainment world. Um, I'm not say shooting a citizen watch ad with Leonardo DiCaprio or something like right. that. Yes. Someday. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. <laughs> but yeah, most of the work that I'm doing, especially the celebrity work, is for editorial outfits, i.e. the Associated Press. Um, occasionally you're shooting something for the Times. I do a lot of work for Red Bull. Uh, so clients like that, um, you know, they give me this access, generally speaking. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, I'm able to get in touch with a festival. Um, do you, do you find yourself like if there's a festival coming up, you're like, oh, I really want to be involved in that. Do you start making pitches to them uh, or, or do you just try to get a, a, a pass? I mean, I'm, I'm curious how that works. I try to when it feels appropriate. I do try to get in touch with a festival directly. Yeah. If if there is interest on my end and it seems like something that I want to dive into, um, oftentimes initially looking at it as, say, a personal project, yeah. which could be, I'm sure, something that we'll probably show in a few is some backstage portrait studios that I've done. Um, but I've done a mix of those and even just having all access at festivals where I am getting access directly from the festival. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they have a million people reaching out to them to try to do the same thing. So obviously having certain clients under my belt, as I do, is definitely helpful. It's sort of a calling card, if you will. And yeah. it's not like I'm saying, oh, I'm... Uh, I'm shooting this for Rolling Stone. You, you obviously can't do that unless you are, but to, you know, for somebody to look at your bio or to see where you have been published, mm -hmm. I think definitely builds confidence in them. Sure. Of your abilities, sure. of the potential of where this work could show this up. This photo is hilarious. <laughs> that was a good find. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I heard he had to use the bathroom, so I had to, uh, of course, follow the stilt walker there because <laughs> you, you knew it was going to be interesting. <laughs> um, well, really cool, really cool. Um, so... In a minute, one of the things I saw on your on your site is video. Are you getting? In, are you shooting video, or was this more like uh, features on you? It's mostly uh, behind the scenes work right now. So it's just sort of uh, GoPro behind the scenes clips that I've put up. Um, I have actually been talking to a few people recently about doing some DPing some some music videos and that sort of thing, which uh -huh. I'm very interested in doing. Um, when I used to work for Joe, I did all of his behind the scenes videos, and it's something that I really am interested in. But for the sort of Last couple of years of my career, I've really just been concentrating on stills and really trying to solidify a brand in that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to dive into something 100% and I don't kind of want to, you know, right. go half-assed into it. So, yeah. um, but it's something that I'm really interested in doing. And I think that uh, coming up in the next year, so that's something that I'm going to start to dive into for sure. That's cool. That's cool. So, yeah. You had mentioned your backstage studios sure. and everything. And, and that's one of the things that's, uh, you know, you, you go and you shoot journalistically, but you also then, I mean, do you shoot this stuff journalistically as well? Not yep. journalistically, documentary type work as well. And then you did these, or is this just? This is, it's sort of a mix of the two. So some of these I'll, you know, I'll shoot uh, a musician at a studio backstage and then I'll also say, you know, ask if they're cool with me shooting them, tuning up, say side stage right before they go on to perform. Uh huh. Something like that, or, or photograph them backstage in a green room aside from the studio stuff. So I do really try to kind of, uh, encompass as much of the sort of experience as I possibly can yeah uh, as well as the live show of course but I really enjoy uh, having a mix of something that's sort of a, a produced portrait uh -huh. um, no matter the size of the production it can be huge can be really small and simple uh, as well as something that is really kind of raw and candid and and journalistic yeah especially if you're doing something for a journalism client they 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 want variety, you sure. know, they, they, you know, if you just go, I mean, for instance, you mentioned the Bieber thing. I was supposed to, at the very beginning, was just supposed to do the first three songs with them, but yep. talked my way back, ended up doing behind the scenes and it led to a whole crazy, you know, thing with him. Of course. So, I mean, that, speaking of, you know, you're doing all these, the, all this music work. Do you ever, would it be like a, something that you'd want to do to be on tour with somebody for yeah, absolutely. I've done a little bit of tour work, and I might actually be going on tour next Monday. Oh, cool! Yeah. Like uh, like a long tour? Or? Uh, about a week. Okay. Yeah, nothing too big. Just, just sort of stage, East Coast, if you will. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, I really do enjoy the the bit of tour work that I've done, and uh, yeah, I always welcome that. Are these band members or also like the crew and stuff? And the there's some festival goers as well. Oh, gotcha. um, yeah. Sometimes myself or or say an assistant who's working with me will get sort of one of the all access passes that 
also enable us to escort people back. So if we find a really cool fan, we can bring them backstage and photograph them real quick and then escort them out. Right. <laughs> and then escort them out promptly. <laughs> yes. Um, cool. One of the things that I'd like to show um, also is mm -hmm. your, you have a portfolio here from Cuba. I do. And I, you know, this is, I, I'm a big fan of Cuba. I just, I mean, maybe not their policy over the last 50 years, but sure. in terms of the country, the people, the color, the beauty, the just everything else is amazing. You, I, I went back in 2008 uh -huh. and you just went last year. I did. I went over Christmas and New Year's of uh, 2014 into 2015. Uh -huh. I was there for just over two weeks. What was your experience like going in? What was your percept? What did you think it was going to be like versus what it was like when you finally got there? And was there culture uh, shock? There's there's so many different aspects to that. Um, I think I was pretty well prepared visually uh, just from speaking to a lot of people who had been there in the past seeing tons of photos, obviously, of the classic cars and yeah. all of that. Um, I think I was unprepared for the sites on some of the streets that literally just looked like a war zone I mean, with complete lack of infrastructure and construction sites that have clearly not been touched in 20 or 30 years, just yeah. like holes in the ground. It's still um, like that, you know? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think one thing that I was absolutely blown away by, and I can't completely put my finger on it, but was just the lighting. In general, it's just I want to attribute it to these like really beautiful pastel -y colored buildings and all these crazy textured buildings that are really high so that even in the middle of the day when the sun is really high, there's all this beautiful bounced light. Like you, you can find gorgeous light in Havana and most other cities that I've been to in Cuba, mm -hmm. no matter what time of day you're shooting in, just because there's just gorgeous soft light bouncing all over the place. Mm -hmm. I, I can't exactly tell you what that reason is, but... I, I don't think I've ever experienced light like that. Yeah. So it's like, it's a street photographer's dream. Uh, I mean, I, I went down with one small camera and didn't bring a flash or a reflector or anything and uh, just had a blast. And I would absolutely recommend uh, anybody to go there. Well, and, now and especially it's, it's open, you yep. know, it's like, this is something you can do. And sure. my feeling is that this is going to change completely. It's scary. Soon enough. I mean, I remember thinking that it was going to change back. It was 2008 when I went sure. and you know, oh my gosh, it's, you know, even people were saying, you know, I, well, I, some of the people that I, that I photographed, there's like, come back, visit us again, come back 10 years, 20 years. We'll be right here doing the exact same thing. Of course. Um, but I've also was being told that, um, you know, with the you know potential of it being opened back up, which it has since then, that uh, investors are just going to take over the place and, and redo it. And it's going to become a, a tourist Mecca again. Uh, yeah. And it's it's a it's a concern. I think um, obviously the the Cuban people will welcome tourists. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure it was the same with you, how, you know, just saying that you're you're from New York or from the United States everybody wants to talk to you. Everybody is so happy that oh, you're yeah. there. And uh, it was it was pretty cool. So um, that is, it's going to change in, to a certain extent. I don't know how much of an extent it will. I'm, I'm My biggest fear is like a Club Med opening up yeah. in Havana, which ugh, I just, I just, Prairie doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, speaking of before we get off Cuba, I'm just remembering this now, uh -huh. but I, I went for three weeks straight. Cool. And just kind of, I had no agenda. It was just, having life experience. Sure. So I would go because, in the, and also during like the, the two hours of the heat of the day, it was just like crappy light. And I would, I would actually go to one of the hotels and to the pool on top and get lunch or something. But basically the rest of the day, what I would do is I just walk down the streets. I'd get one, like a two cola, right. Which is their Coke. And I'd get the box of rum and just make a rum and Coke and just walk around. Like, yeah, just take pictures, beautiful light, meet it's people. It's not a bad thing. And that's what like <laughs> most everyone else was doing too. You know, it was sure. good, good times. Okay, so I want to jump into this uh, portrait series here. This is from uh, Pride uh, Parade. This was Pride Day last year. Yeah, it was obviously with, um, you know, it was it was a very historic day, mm -hmm. especially last year. And uh, I just sort of had an idea the day before, maybe two days before, to just kind of run down there, I uh, went with my assistant, and we just, uh, as you saw from that first photo, uh, literally just taped a piece of Seamless to uh, a wall, and I did light Simple it. What was that? I, so what did you use to light? I was a three-foot uh, Profoto Octa, oh, okay. and a B1, which is their battery-operated lithium-ion 
And how lights. long did that? I mean, th- that that works for a while. I mean, oh I've, yeah, I've used those Profoto B ones uh, at the Eddie Adams workshop. We, sure, we they're had great. A, you know, great. access to them so that's very cool love them i mean it wasn't so much with a light like that you're not so much overpowering the sun because it's 400 watt seconds mm-hmm. but um what i was doing was kind of finding a shaded spot mm-hmm. um something that that was a underneath an overhang or something like that and mm-hmm. uh and then filling with the three foot octa so is that is, is an octa one of your go-to's like do you, do it is a lot of my portrait work um, tends to be uh, a single person or one or two people uh-huh. um, a lot of what I'm called in to do by the Associated Press is it's either shooting a, a junket for a new film that's coming out or uh, shooting a single person who's coming into the AP offices to do an interview for a new album or something like that nice <laughs> nice <laughs> booty there Jeez. Um, so in, in when you uh, shoot these types of things on uh-huh. man on the street, woman on the street, man, a man on the street. Um, do you, uh, do you usually just, I mean, was this was a personal project, you yep. know? So did you end up getting their info and sending them pictures or does that just happen? Some of the I time? did. I didn't have these, uh, released and that's, I, I try to get things released whenever I can, but in a situation like this, I was working so fast and everyone was sort of running around. This was sort of at the finish line of the, uh, parade. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people are, kind of bombarded by photographers, mostly street photographers covering for papers and whatnot, who are just having them pose for a quick photo in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a lot going on, so I did have to be quite quick about it. Yeah. But I did get their information, and I did send a lot of them photos. And it looks like you did something similar here at this Tough Mudder. Correct. Um, is this just a this is just a backdop? It's look, or is this one of those lit backdrops? That's one of the. It's called the Last Light Highlight Background Kit. Oh. It's. Um, I believe so you've got two two lights inside the backdrop here. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, if you take a piece of background paper with you on location, it's gonna crumble the second there's any sort of wind. Uh-huh. Um, there's vinyl backdrops and things of that sort that are super heavy kind of a pain but this thing's really cool it it folds down like a, a large round reflector uh-huh. um, and it's actually three-dimensional so it has an interior to it that you can put lights inside of uh-huh. uh, so that's what that is it's basically a stand-up that was uh I believe it was a six by eight foot uh highlight background very cool so yeah i tried to do sort of a before and after portrait studio at one of these tough mudder races and they knew to come to you afterwards yep i've always wanted to maybe try one of those but i don't it's pretty pretty crazy, pretty but, grueling. but quite cool, yeah. Yeah, so look at that. That's that's pretty interesting there. How that uh, so basically what it's doing is it's 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 it can also you can also play like overpower it and give it, give some interesting effects as well. Oh I sure, imagine. sure. Um, um, in a case like this, I was uh, I didn't have when I do my backstage portrait studios. I'm oftentimes I'm always working with you know uh, bare minimum like a twelve by twelve foot silk overhead. Right. So a large diffuser overhead, which enables me to work through the worst light of the day. In a situation like this, it was pretty, pretty uh, slim in terms of production scale. So I was essentially just using uh, these flashes at that time to overpower the sun when need be. So, so, so I was using a lot of flash. Power. You know, it's funny we went we went from Cuba to this. Sure. And the difference is just about couple hundred pounds of gear absolutely and which are better photos you I mean, it's, you, it's, it's arguable yeah. either way right right totally and and so that's another thing is that um you know myself the thing that i differs between you and i is i very rarely use the big the big gear like sure. this um but this is a regular thing for you which which means that you usually need an assistant usually need you know help essentially just look not i mean you need help schlepping it you need help you know, making sure the lights are going off while you're working with the clients and everything, Absolutely. Um, which is just more of a production all around. Um, do you, so do, when you say you have an assistant, do you have like a go to kind of in the same way that you were Joe's go to or do you have just a handful? I so I was full time with Joe. Um, I don't have a full time assistant, uh, but I do have a couple of uh, a couple of guys that I use quite regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I do. I do have probably three or four definite go to's that I use quite frequently. But um yeah, and it doesn't come down to me saying, "Oh, I really, I want to, I want to only shoot setups that involve four lights." Like that's not at all what I'm going for. Mm-hmm. Um, but if a job dictates that that happens, you need to know. In my mind, you need to know how to pull something like that off, and that's a huge part of what I learned by working for Joe for so long is how to produce a shoot kind of of any size. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if I'm told to come into a room, say at the Associated Press, 
They have a room that's probably a 15 by 15 foot room that is, there's no windows. It doesn't have any light coming in other than the fluorescence in the ceiling. If you can tell me that you're gonna go in there like without flash and shoot a great portrait, probably not. Um, and they need something that's a really clean, reproducible headshot, if you will, yeah. um, to go along with the story. Yeah. And I'm always trying to push for something more than that, but um, so, I can't do that without using some sort of light. So let's talk about that real quick before uh -huh. we jump into this series. Sure. Um, a lot of what I do also are these type, I, you know, in terms of celebrity, I do a lot of celebrity portraits as well. And it's a lot of these press junkets, sure. right? So, you know, such and such movie comes out production company rents out the entire floor of the Ritz Carlton, let's say. And, uh, you know, you're put into a room, you've got an hour or 30 minutes or whatever. Depends. Hours is good. <laughs> it depends. I always see, okay, so that's what I was getting at. I always try to show up as early as possible Same, yeah. to get there and then set up as many situations as possible just so that I can give my editor, you know, a variety of mm -hmm. options. Um, a lot of, and I learned this, I like uh, Dam Dam Damon Winter at the uh, he was at the LA Times back when I met him okay. I interned there and uh, you know learned I learned from a lot of these pros you know going into these quick situations or, or Fred Conrad at the New York Times or, or whatever and I was just amazed at how you know they would just go in they'd survey they would come up with the the concepts they would talk they would then have to talk the the celebrity or, or whoever into doing these like here i want you in the bathtub mm -hmm. or you know which is kind of like an awkward thing to say um but um you know so i guess what i'm trying to get at is you know i've been through that as well and i can understand that you know you you really just want to get as much variety as you can out of those you know sometimes just a few minutes that you have with these celebrities. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And it's a huge challenge. It's something that I do pride myself in, generally speaking, being able to do yeah. uh, as tough as it can be sometimes. And uh, yeah, you, you know, you want to get as much setup time as you possibly can, but it's often, uh, you know, a minute that I have with somebody or even less. I just, uh, a few months back, I photographed Ed Sheeran. Right. Which was on the And end. I had, I think it was 47 seconds with him. Mm hmm and after that, he literally kind of walked away. So, yeah, I mean, I got something really nice out of it because I I planned it out beforehand. But you never really know, yeah, you know. And so it's 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 having concepts going into the shoot and then hoping that they work out when you get there because it really is in a situation like that. It's oftentimes really just winging it. So the photo, I mean, just I, I kind of want to show that photo now. But um, the photo you're talking about is this one right here. Yep. Um, and it was, you had a prop, you know, like, I did. and I'm sure that, you know, you have a few minutes, it would have just been him against this backdrop if you didn't have that prop, but that really added a bit of dimension and some playfulness to it. Sure. In a situation like that, I mean, what I was trying to do. And he was to up do, to it. He, I'm sorry. And he was up to it. Well. You see, that's the thing. He's trying to convince these people to do something. He didn't, he didn't care. I mean, he was a nice enough guy. I didn't, you know, people, and that's another interesting point. Everyone's like, oh, you get to meet all these celebrities and hang out with them. No, Sometimes not really. Yeah. Very, very rarely. Um, I, I, mean, make, the, I make people think that on social. Sure, sure. <laughs> We're, yeah, my good I friend mean, Ed. <laughs> probably the coolest to date that actually was a great story was hang. I will say hanging out because photographed and then actually just conversed with Quincy Jones for about half an hour uh -huh. uh, last year. And that was the coolest thing ever. But um, yeah, for the most part, I'm with people for a very short amount of time. I'm not really connecting with them on every level, but what you're trying to do is produce a photo that looks as though you have a connection with somebody or, or you break through something and you get past the ordinary, right? right? And that's what makes an intriguing photo. You want to catch somebody's attention for more than a half a second. Sure. You want somebody to look a photo, look at a photo, and say, "Oh wow, that's really cool," um, or, or shoot something that's really storytelling. And, and those things are are difficult in the uh, amount of time that's generally speaking allotted to those types of shoots. Yeah. So it's it's a fight on multiple levels, but uh, occasionally you have some pretty nice wins. So. So I want to get get to um, some some of your work that you've been doing with Nikon. Sure. Um, this is uh, titled Nikon Casting Call. Can you yes. explain a little? This was a shoot that I did last year, or I guess the end of 2014 uh, for the Nikon, the new 300 F4 lens. Uh, so I did a casting call in my living room. Um, it was a smaller shoot, so I, I casted it myself. And um, This was in your living room? This was. Nice. Uh, so I, I photographed all the people. I probably had 35, 40 people come in over the course of two days, and... I photographed them again, so, you know, gray or white, something that I was going to send to the client. But then I also had another lighting set up on the side 
to do this sort of silhouette series that I had started just before that. So had some pretty cool uh, characters come into my place. So mm -hmm. uh, tried to get something out of what is typically a pretty mundane, uh, I don't even want to call it a shoot, but a casting call. It's not like the most exciting thing right. in the world to shoot. It's like your generic like kind of full length and headshot of somebody against a wall. Yeah. So I tried to do something a bit more with that. So so that was last year for, for a shoot that I did for them. And um, more recently here, um, this is pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to go where well, there's not going to be any uh, music in this, but sure. uh, let's talk about this project we've got. This so yeah, this was a project that I just photographed for, for Nikon Japan. Again, this is that's Nikon Global Headquarters uh, for the new Nikon DL. Um, specifically, I worked with the 2485 camera, and this was a shoot down in uh, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. um, it was a dream assignment in, let the, in that they sort of, uh, you know, they gave me uh, they gave me a budget, and they there were certain things, obviously a shot list that I needed to mm -hmm. uh, demonstrate, lots of things technically and whatnot. But I could kind of uh, do whatever I wanted, you know, providing that they signed off on it, and. Uh, I was down at this uh, really amazing hotel in Nicaragua for vacation last August and uh, really kind of clicked with the owner of the hotel and the staff there. And and uh, that enabled me to sort of have some people on the ground to help me produce a small shoot. So went back down to Nicaragua uh, the beginning of December uh, to shoot this and uh, had a really, really great time. Um, yeah, I was down there. Uh, Mike Cardiello, who's an assistant who I work with a lot here in the city, came down with me. Uh, June Freedom, who's a buddy of mine from L.A., who's a musician. He was sort of my muse or model for the week. Uh, Dave Geffen, who's an incredible videographer here. He's amazing. In I'm the working city. him on some projects yeah, as well. He yeah, he came down to Nicaragua with me, and my client came in from Tokyo. And we just had a really, really great time with it and shot over five days down there. So, um, And then I also shot the uh, 18 to 50 uh, there's three different versions of this camera, and I shot that one when I was uh, sort of on vacation uh, over the over Christmas and uh, New Year's in Asia. So, gotcha. Uh, yeah, so those photos will be out soon as well, I'm sure. Really cool. Thanks. Um, so, you know, we've gone through so much, you know, your, your career, you know, the different styles of work that you do, and, uh, you know, sort of now that we're towards the end of this podcast, I just want to... Uh, again, talk a little, little bit about business and maybe maybe address um, the younger, you know, the up and comers that that want would love to have the opportunity to work for, you know, a, a brand or uh, a corporation or you know shoot a concert like this. Sure. What what would be your recommendations uh, for somebody that's looking to do what you're doing in this field today? Because things have changed since we started of course. film to digital to social media and all that kind of stuff. Of course. I mean, not to sound cliche, but um, truly the only way to get really good at this is to do it a lot. That is absolutely the case no matter who you are. Um, you know, we will all tell you the same thing. Um, you need to do this a lot. And it's something that you have to be really passionate about, uh, incredibly passionate about if you, if you have a desire to do this uh, for a living. Um, this is all I know how to do well, and that's, you know, this is, it sort of called me and I stuck with it, and I'm very fortunate to be able to make a living doing this. Um, it's not something that I take for granted at all, and it, and it's, it has its challenges for sure. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, your typical nine to five. There's no, you know, I had some plans this weekend, and I just got an email two hours ago to do a two-day shoot this weekend. Okay, now I don't have weekend no, plans because no I have a two-day shoot. Cool. You have to. Know. It's what's happened with us in the podcast. I was we were supposed to do this in the evening, like, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we were supposed to do this last year at some point oh, as yeah. well. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, so yeah, in the freelance world, things things change all the time, and and uh, yeah, it's it's not for everybody, and you can't blame somebody who who isn't cool with that um, because it's it's not a normal lifestyle. But I I really really do love it, and I'm very happy to be able to do this. Um, but yeah, doing it a lot and, and start out small. I mean, if you're interested in shooting bands, okay, that's great. Um, I'd encourage you to do that, but don't uh, go get in touch with, you know, Rolling Stone or Ink Magazine to shoot some up and coming band. Like, start out small, get in touch with a local band, um, a friend's up and coming band, something like that. The last thing you want to do is put yourself in a situation where, you know, you're putting yourself in front of a client that you're clearly not at all prepared for. So, yeah, start small and work your way up from there um, and, and do it a lot. 
And so also we should mention, you know, this is, you've been, I mean, you were staff with Joe for a while. Uh Uh-huh. That now, now is really the first time you've gone freelance, right? It is. Um, I mean, technically speaking, I've been in the industry for about 10 years. I finished school in 2005. I uh, freelanced for a couple years in a pretty small market in Pennsylvania, uh-huh. shooting like mostly weddings, doing weddings and events, that sort of stuff. Yeah. And uh, and that's when I sort of made the jump and started working for Joe full time in 2008. Right. Um, so, yeah, I worked for him uh, until... Uh, I think September of 2012. Mm-hmm. So uh, 13, 14, or September of 2013, rather. So it's basically this past September, September of 2015, was my two year anniversary, technically speaking, of being full time freelance. Obviously, while I was working for Joe, I was. I was shooting and I was progressing and all of that, but I've really just been shooting full, full time, completely on my own, 100% in the New York market for the last two years. And how has that been? Like, how how would you rate the, you know, has has your work been compounding, your client base been compounding, you know? It's been really interesting. Um, As I said earlier, I think working for Joe for so long uh, really enabled me, and it's not like, uh, it enabled me to to prepare myself for the freelance world as best as I could be, but I I was making conscious moves while working for him in that I was always practicing what I was seeing him do, and, there's a huge difference in setting up lighting for somebody than there is actually setting it up for yourself and Mm -hmm. photographing it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I could assist someone forever. And if I'm not actually doing it on my own, there's a very good chance that, that I'm not going to know how to do that for myself. And on top of that, um, developing your own style is a huge thing when you're around somebody for as long as I was, you know, and influenced so much by Joe, by Danny Clinch. Um, they're great influences to have for sure, but you need to really develop your own style and voice in the industry. So, Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's what the last couple of years has been about. Um, trying to really produce uh, a pretty specific niche for myself that I think we're fortunate to be able to do in a market as large as New York City um, that you can't do in, in a smaller market. You know, if you're a full time photographer in Des Moines, you're you're not able to be a music and celebrity photographer. Right. Most likely, right. if any of you are out there from there and you're doing that, props to you. But but it's it's that's a type of market where you probably have to shoot family portraits and There's products just not as much, yeah. and of course yeah. so in new york you can kind of get as specific as you want to get and it's actually advantageous in my opinion to do that because you can in time become the best person at this specific the thing the go-to and, guy or gal and yeah. therefore be able to demand hopefully a high price for yeah. for that yeah uh so it's it's been a really interesting couple of years i'm very happy to have made the move to jump off on my own. Obviously the scariest decision. I had a, a really kind of comfy full-time job with Joe and uh, it was really secure and I was traveling all over, but I kind of just was always in the industry to be doing this on my own for myself. Right. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting adventure for sure, but um, so far very exciting. And working with clients, has it, has it been difficult? I know in like sometimes, for instance, this job that I was supposed to do or I, I th- which met, a, which happened today. I got, I got called on for a job. It was going to be a big one, and then we were putting together the contract. I was just sending them the final revis- revision, and then they canceled on me. Sure. And then we were, I was telling, okay, never mind, guys. It's going to be on the same time, the podcast. And then they called me back the next day and said, well, you know what? They've had a change of heart. They want to have you, you know, bring you back onto this thing. And yep. so, so have you had that uh, often? As oh well? yeah, last week I had. Um, I had a commercial client call me uh, at about 1.30 to ask if I could shoot uh, an executive at a record label at 2.30, uh-huh. an hour after they, they emailed me about this job. And I was like, sure, I think I can get stuff together and make this happen. So, you know, I I respond or I call him right away to say that because it was very time sensitive. Right. I start packing my gear and, you know, he calls me back a few minutes later. Oh, we actually need a certificate of insurance. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I call my insurance company and I, I have them rush a certificate of insurance and I'm like about to walk out the door like 10, 15 minutes later and oh, the, the client, you know, actually meant tomorrow, not today. Oh gosh, so, yeah. Uh, and, Those and things it's, happen, yeah. And that's like the nature of freelance, right? It's like you, a job comes in and you're like, oh my God, cool, I have, I have this job, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do it right now. And, and you know, there's, uh, there's as a freelancer, there's, there's to, to a certain extent, there's, you're thinking about finances, right? Right. And it's like, okay, here's a job, cool. 
that's another like check off for the week or the month, whatever it is. Right. So yeah, you, you, it's hard for us to say no. There's power in saying no for sure. There but, is. Yeah. But if a job uh, seems like it's going to be beneficial in, in a couple ways, then you know you take it. Right. But, um, you do have to balance those things, of course. That's, that's a whole other conversation. It is. Yeah. But, but. And we did. We talked about that that stuff in the panel. We did. Uh, so if you guys check out photobrigade.com slash lives, scroll down to the panels, you'll see his pretty face along with a couple others. Um, they talk all about the business and jump starting your, your, your photo business. So, um, and lastly, you mentioned the certificate of insurance. I had something like that happen and I wasn't sure, you know, my insurance company charges like $25 Same. to get it in insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, and which, you know, when you get called last minute after you've already dealt with things, you know, do you tack that on? I, I actually addressed this question to a, a Facebook group about, you know, should I, you know, is that kosher to do that? And everyone said, yeah, you know, definitely just pass mm -hmm. that along to the to the client. And, and of course I did, and there was no question about it. So, you know, you just gotta, you know, when you're a freelancer, there are all these different pieces of um, business that you just need to need to know, administrative, make sure you're covering your costs. You know, there's, th that when you're staff, you, know, you just go and you shoot and you're using other people's gear. You don't have to worry about that stuff, but sure. Yeah. And, and the business side of it is such a huge thing. Um, <laughs> the TV behind you just turned for some reason. That was weird. Oh no. <laughs> um, okay. yeah, the business end is, is immensely important. And that is, that's been a huge learning curve for me. Um, as well prepared as I was, I mean, just running your own business is, is quite an endeavor. And as we also spoke about in another podcast, uh, the marketing aspect of it, it's, it never ceases to amaze me the amount of time that marketing yourself as a business actually does take up. Right. So that's been a huge sort of time suck, but a necessary one. And then the last thing I'll do is bring up, uh, let's see here. You were on Insta, right? Yeah. So insta.com slash Drew. You can just click the link right there. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Duh. Okay, so um, and last thing I want to talk about is the marketing. Um, of course. Briefly, uh, you know, you you have um, Instagram is one of your um, main, probably one of your main marketing things, and Facebook. Instagram, Facebook, uh, Tumblr, which is which is currently very much in line with my Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I do have a blog as well. Uh, so yeah, I do try to get myself out there as best as possible. Um, you kind of need to, to pick your battles. Um, right. You can only spread yourself so thinly. But, right. But yeah, um, I do try to, you know, get things out there that are timely. Um, as soon as a client gives me a go ahead to post something. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes with the outlets that I'm working with, those things are quite sensitive. So right. I do have to be very conscious of that. Absolutely. But... All right. Well, um, unless there's any questions out in the audience, um, <laughs> I, I'd, uh, I, you know, I, first I want to say thanks again to uh, Adorama, their event space, uh, for letting us do this. Check out our um, our website, uh, photobrigade.com slash live to, to see all of our live events. Click the subscribe button for YouTube. Um, Drew, DrewGurian.com, yep. DrewGurian on all social media. Absolutely. And um, Drew, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Really appreciate right. having me. And we'll see you all next time. Take care.